everybody, welcome back to another episode of Dark Crossroads. This is your host Roxanne Fletcher and today we're doing another episode of Creepy Corner. These are episodes that I read stories that are true crime, paranormal, even funny that are sent in to me through my listeners. Um, if you want your story read on Creepy Corner, don't be afraid to email it to me at darkcrossroadspodcast at gmail.com. You can also do that through www.darkcrossroadspodcast.com. Um, those are two easy ways to send in your stories. Um, if you're new here, welcome. Um, thank you for listening and let us know what you think about us um, by rating or reviewing wherever you're listening to this podcast and hitting that subscribe button because it really does help us out. Um, but with that said, um, let's jump right in. Okay, so this first story comes from a listener that wanted to remain anonymous, so I'm not going to read their name, but the story is titled The Boy With No Eyes. One night when I was about 10, I was woken up by my bedroom door opening, followed by somebody sitting on my bed. I felt my leg grazed and the bed sink under a person's weight. It's just my mom, I thought, and I did try to open my eyes. When my eyes opened... It was not my mom. I saw an eyeless boy. He had black, empty eye sockets about my age sitting at the foot of my bed. He extended his hand, and in it was a little box. I was startled, but reached out. He pulled back, and I reached out again and said, Give it. Then I blinked, and when I reopened my eyes, he was gone. But I could still see the imprint where he'd sat on my bed. Fast forward five years, my girlfriend came over to do some homework. After she finished, she took a nap while she waited for her parents. When they arrived, I tried waking her up. She opened her eyes suddenly, looking up at a corner where the wall met the ceiling. She pointed there and went back to sleep. I shook her again to try to wake her up again. When she came to full consciousness and I explained what she had done, she looked haunted. Up on the wall, I saw a little boy with no eyes. He was there, in a Spider-Man pose, just staring at me. I freaked out and told her my story about the same kid. Fast forward about five years, I was with the same girlfriend, and we had a two-year-old child. We were living in my parents' house in my old room. My daughter started waking up at the same time every night. When she did wake up, she would be talking. After a while, I noticed she had almost the same conversation every single night. I playfully asked her once who she was talking to. She said, it's a little boy. He's nice. He's lost and he's looking for his mommy. My daughter's nightly conversations continued until we got our own place later that year. This next story comes from Jess. Fresh out of nursing school, I got my first real job in a fairly large hospital in a department that I honestly never thought I would ever work in. It was a six-bed cardiac ICU unit with rooms that overlooked the city capitol building. It was a very nice unit, and I started out working 12-hour night shifts. The hospital I worked at had four other ICUs that were always full, so my unit always ended up being the code beds, meaning if someone was arrested... I'm guessing cardiac arrest, or went downhill fast, somewhere around the hospital, they would come to us. I had been working there for a year, and I was no stranger to death. Each patient of mine who had died on my shift was usually already on their way out. Their families were by their side, the DNR order was already signed, the funeral home was already picked out. It was rarely ever a surprise. In fact, the only time I would was ever needed to do CPR on my shift, it was not even in my department. So I went on a nice long two-week vacation, got engaged, and had a beautiful tan. On my first night back, I received a report from the day charge nurse. She said that she was off for a few days and suggested that to remind the next day charge nurse that the priest was coming in the morning to bless room four. I thought she was kidding at first, but she was very serious. Apparently, while I was on vacation, every patient who was admitted to that room had died. But this came as no shock to me. People died often in our department, and it being a very religious institution, having a chaplain for almost every department. I just shook this off. Then she said that room four was empty and that it would serve as the code bed for the night. Around 2 a.m., I got a call saying that they have someone to fill our open bed. 
The ICU downstairs was now going to be code bed, so we were getting your run-of-the-mill, chest pain, take a look in the morning kind of patient. Nothing to get excited about. We get the patient admitted and all settled into room four. He was a gentleman around 50 or so years old. He was very pleasant. His wife was with him and she looked dead on her feet. I got her some warm blankets and took her to our waiting room that had cots so she could get some rest. Around 3.30 in the morning, I was watching the monitors and the cameras in each room. All of the patients were fast asleep. The cameras all cycled through about three seconds each on one small TV we had on the desk. Room one was doing fine. Room two was doing fine also. And room three was doing fine also. When I got to room four, there was somebody in there. It cycled too quickly for me to get a good look and the doors to the unit were locked. Maybe the other nurses let his wife back in. I walked down the hall to just glance in. There was nobody in there. So I shrugged this off. Also, it was late. I was tired. It was probably just something that I was seeing. I went back to the desk and continued watching the screen. Room one, room two, room three, room four. I was not imagining anything. There was somebody in room four. The person was standing in the corner by the window, their figure completely draped in shadow. I could not move my body. It cycled through again. This time, it was closer to the patient's bed. By maybe two or three feet, the hair stood straight up on the back of my neck. The next time it cycled through, it was even closer. It stood in the light coming from the hallway, but despite the light, it was still shrouded in darkness. It cycled through again, and it was right next to the bed. My heart started pounding, and I could barely squeak to the nurse on the other end of the desk. As soon as my words formed and I was able to make some kind of noise to get her attention, the alarm on the monitor went off, signaling that the patient had just went into cardiac arrest. The overhead system came on. A cart is needed in the CCU room for people poured into the department, Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, they all rushed into the room, but I was frozen and I couldn't move. It cycled through the rooms again. Room four came up, and this time the lights were on and there were 10 to 15 people surrounding the bed, doing CPR and slamming meds into his IVs. Someone went to get his wife from the waiting room, but there it was in the opposite corner again, a dark figure watching the scene just play out, just standing there. The man died of a heart attack. Room four was blessed that morning, right on schedule, and that day I put in my two weeks notice. Okay, so this next story is titled Grandma's Home. My grandmother lives in a very stereotypical horror movie house, a small Midwest town, white and old looking home on a farm. She even has a chipped wooden Mary nativity in the front yard. She also has a cemetery about a half a mile down the road. I used to sleep in the room in the corner on the top floor. This used to be my aunt's room, and it had a wooden rocking chair in the room. When I was younger, I would wake up because I thought I would hear the rocking chair rocking, to the point where I would wake up my grandmother and have to stay in her room overnight. About 10 years later, my mom, aunt, and I were talking about how creepy my grandmother's house is. My aunt goes on to talk about how, when she was younger, the reason my mom and her ended up sharing a room was because she thought her room was haunted. She said that she woke up one morning and the rocking chair was about two feet closer to her bed, and after that night, it would start rocking on a nightly basis at midnight every night. This next story comes from Liz, and the way she wrote it is in like a list form, so I'm going to read um, her experiences as she wrote them. She states, I lived in an old haunted house in college. Things got so weird that everybody ended up moving out except for me and one of my roommates. I woke up at 3 a.m. once because my roommate's door kept opening and slamming shut. From the bed, I yelled for him to stop, only to realize I was the only one home that weekend. As soon as I yelled, the slamming stopped, but the hippie beads I had hanging outside my closed door began to sway perfectly, yet violently, against the door frame for a half hour. While I debated if I should pop out my air conditioner and just jump out the window, I laid in the fetal position in bed till it stopped. 
Another experience is I woke up at 3 a.m. again, alone, hearing the Nintendo on the back porch playing very loudly. I figured a drunk kid might have came in and started playing. I grabbed a bat and walked toward the back of the house as the music got louder and louder. As soon as I opened the door, it was completely quiet. Mind you, it was loud enough to wake me up. I had friends over and told them the house was haunted. Nobody believed me, so I asked the ghost to do anything to prove that it was there. As soon as I asked, all the lights in the house began flickering for about a minute straight. This was the middle of the day, and everybody witnessed it. Almost everybody who stayed at my house ended up having sleep paralysis at least one time. Every time something spooky happened, the house would smell like old lady, flowery, strong perfume. This house had a door built into the flooring that led to the basement. We always had a rug covering it up so no one knew that it was there. Things would constantly go missing in the house and turn up in the basement. This house had a coal chute from which it was heated by coal back in the day. Missing stuff would always be placed on the chute for us to come and get. One of my roommates ended up having some issues. Once while playing video games late at night, he saw this mist kind of hovering from the kitchen and then move into the bathroom. The bathroom had a trap door that led to the attic, and that's where we figured the old lady ghost used to like to hang out. One of my roommates was up late at night, and he went to go lock the doors and turn off the lights. When he turned his back on the room and walked to the door, somebody breathed in his ear. <sighs> he thought it was me. I was sleeping. He turned around, pissed himself, and then ran to his room. He was too afraid to come out and turn off lights or the TV. Loud thumps in the attic at all hours. For peace of mind, we told ourselves that squirrels must have gotten up there or something. Voices would wake us up in the middle of the night. I spent many mornings on the front porch, waiting for the sun to come up before I went back in the house. Coincidentally, I had a friend years later that rented from the same landlord, same town but different houses, where he and all of his roommates moved out because that house was also haunted. I didn't think it was too weird until he was telling me that when all of the weird stuff happened, it was accompanied by old lady, flowery, stinky perfume. Also, a lot of people had sleep paralysis in that house as well. <sighs> this next story comes from Emily. My mom was driving, and all of a sudden, this guy ran out in the middle of the road. She stopped suddenly so she wouldn't hit him. It was at nighttime, so it was really dark. And then all of a sudden, three other men emerged from the forest around her car, surrounded her car, and all tried using the door handles to get inside. She locked the car and floored it to the nearest town. Remember to always lock your car after you start it, because if it wasn't unlocked, who knows what would have happened. This next story comes from Charlie. My mom's friend had a small house and lived all alone. She noticed weird things going on around her house. A bowl of soup depleting faster than usual, missing eggs, damp towels in the hamper when she hadn't used any towels, extra dishes in the dishwasher, etc. This went on for many months, and she thought she was just being forgetful. One day, she heard some thumping around in the attic and went to investigate. She found some makeshift living quarters, a small radio, a hot plate, sleeping bag, pillow, food wrappers, and a lot more. She called the cops who came to keep an eye on the place. They ended up catching a homeless man climbing a tree trying to sneak into her attic window. He had been doing this almost every single day. He would wait for her to go to work and then go downstairs and help himself to food and the rest of the house, pretty much. The funny part about this story is they got to know each other throughout the ordeal, and the guy was actually very respectful, just very down on his luck. She didn't press any charges, but instead, she let him move in, helped him get a job, and he lived in the attic until he got back on his feet. Creepy shit with a happy ending. This next story is titled WTF, and it is from Anonymous too, so I'm not going to be saying their name. 
Years ago, when I was eight years old, my family lived in this big, weird house, kind of on the edge of a small town. The school district was in the middle of a big restructuring, so even though we were only a couple of grades apart, my brother and I went to different schools and took different buses home. This left me as the last person to leave in the morning and the first person to get home in the afternoon, which meant it was my job to make sure that all of the lights were off and the door was locked. One morning, I noticed the basement door was open and the light was on, so before I left, I turned off the light and closed the door. When I got home that afternoon, the light was on and the door was open again. I just assumed that I'd forgotten to actually take care of it when I noticed it in the morning, so I went over to turn off the light and close the door. When I got to the top of the basement stairs, I looked, and there was a big, shadowy male figure towards the bottom of the staircase. I freaked out, slammed the door, and pushed a bunch of boxes against it, and then went and hid in my closet. For months, I didn't tell my family because I was positive that what I had seen was a ghost, and I didn't think anyone would believe me. Then about a year after this incident, my mom and her boyfriend started noticing that small amounts of money had been going missing for months. This money totaling around $800, $900, but never more than $60 at once. So we all walked around the house with flashlights, trying to figure out how they could have gotten in. Turns out, some creep was climbing in through a small hole in the outside of the house, shimmying through a crawl space, then coming up into the house through the basement. Realizing I had been alone in the house with him on at least one occasion was one of the worst, most terrifying moments I have ever experienced in my life. (sighs) This next story is from Alex. When my dad was a teenager, he and some of his friends got really drunk one night and went for a drive on some back roads and were going as fast as the truck would go. My dad was slightly less drunk than the others and eventually demanded that they let him get out. They pulled over and he and one other girl got out. He and the girl started walking to town while the other three sped off in the opposite direction. Less than a mile up the road from where they got out is an extremely sharp turn, which the truck ended up missing and hitting a tree going pretty close to triple digits miles per hour, so close to over 100 miles per hour. Two of them died on impact, and the only reason the third survived is because they crashed in front of a house that two doctors lived in. The survivor was paralyzed and lost his leg and a part of his arm, and was in the hospital for eight months before dying. This was in the 60s, so medical care wasn't what it is today. When I first got my permit, my dad took me to the corner to explain the importance of safe driving. It gave me goosebumps about how close he was to being in that truck. He said that the dad of the driver got what remained of the truck to be hung up in the middle of the town for months after, for a warning to all. This next story comes from Carrie. In my hometown in the early 90s, there was a notorious killer that had the whole state on watch. My husband's mother, years before I knew them, had been home alone while her husband was out of state doing tree work. She was in her laundry room when a man ends up walking up from the basement, completely scaring her. She freaks out and ends up saying, what the hell are you doing here? He said he was friends with her husband and was just coming to see if he was there. Apparently, he had told him that he could just walk in. When he says this, she immediately knows that this is BS. She was smart enough to tell him that he was just at the store and would be back any minute now. The man said that he would wait outside for him, and as soon as he left, she called the police. But he was long gone by the time that they got there. Two weeks later, the killer that was loose was caught. His mugshot was put on TV, and it was a guy that was coming up from her basement. Okay, our last story comes from Skyler. I was working the evening shift at a gas station. This man ends up coming in, acting all disoriented and stuff. I realize that he needs help, so I go and try to help him out. He has this big gash on his head, and he doesn't know where he is. I couldn't see any crashes around the area, so I just assumed that he had fallen or something. Normally, we are not supposed to leave our area. We're supposed to stay inside the glass-shielded register area whenever anyone is in the store. 
I, trying to be a nice human being, went to help while calling the police and EMS. They got there, they checked him out. They thought that his head may have been fractured. They end up taking him to the ER, and I just went back to work. The cops that were at the scene end up stopping back by for some coffee a few hours later. They end up telling me that the guy was hit by a baseball bat while trying to break into a girl's bedroom and was also wanted for murder in two other states. Let's just say I never left the register area at night ever again. All right, guys, thank you for hanging out again today. I love this creepy corner segment of the show. Um, It just makes me happy to just kind of mix it up a little bit. I hope you guys are enjoying it too. Also, don't forget to send in any of your stories to be read on the podcast. And please, when you do, leave out any information that you do not want read. If you don't want your name read or just change up the names, that's fine too. Um, also don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, like rate, review, subscribe, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Um, and we did get rid of Patreon. We're now, um, doing something different. I mentioned it in our last episode. And, um, so if you want any exclusive content, promo codes to the upcoming store, anything else, Don't forget to subscribe to that link on Facebook and you will have access to extra, extra content that won't be on the podcast and all a bunch of other goodies. So don't forget that. And with that said, I will see you guys next time and don't forget to keep on creeping on. Dark Crossroads Podcast is brought to you by Problem Wildlife. Problem Wildlife serves Western Massachusetts and has been humanely protecting your house and family from unwanted pests for over 20 years. Take back your space with an animal control service that you can trust. They are family owned, fully licensed, and are knowledgeable and dependable. To find out more about their services, simply visit their website at www.problemwildliferemoval.com. Again, that's www.problemwildliferemoval.com. And the website will also be included in our show notes.